streaming to Facebook. We're live streaming. Good evening, everybody. I am happy to welcome you all tonight to the start of our fourth year of the Big Hearted Warrior Tour. So 2020 was our first year. Uh, we did half the year and we are entering season four, if you will. And we are tra traveling around the country meeting HCMA recognized Center of Excellence care teams. And tonight we're joined by Columbia Presbyterian, New York Presbyterian. You have so many names. I always get them all confused. I'll let Shep give you the proper nameage in just a moment. Um, and our, our teammates right here, we're in New Jersey, they're in New York. They're on that side of the bridge. We're on this side of the bridge. We envy each other's sides of the bridge from time to time. And tonight we're going to be meeting their faculty and or some of their faculty, and we're going to have some interesting talks. Uh, I want to introduce my team and go over some, um, some housekeeping issues with you. Um, if you're joining on Facebook, we are only streaming on Facebook. You cannot ask questions on Facebook. If you would like to join us, you can go to 4hcm.org, go to the events page, register and come get a link right away. And you can join us in the Zoom room where you'll be able to ask questions and interact with us. If you're watching on Facebook and you have questions, that's the only way that you're gonna get through to us. So please do so if you wanna ask questions. If you're watching this after its original air date of January 19th, 2023, 6.30 p.m. Eastern, we're not here to be live with you. So this will run live till about 8.30 this evening. Um, and it will live here and on our YouTube channel after this night. So that being said, I have with me from the HCMA team, I have Stacey Titus, who is our Center of Excellence Coordinator. Stacey, you wanna say hi to everybody? Good evening, everybody. And Julie Russo, our Volunteer Coordinator. Uh, Julie, you wanna say hi? Hi, everybody. So if you have any technical problems during the night, you can use the chat feature and Julie and Stacy can help you with technical issues. If you have any questions for our faculty or questions related to HCMA services, you can use the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. If you click on that now, you'll have the opportunity to write a question and our faculty can answer it throughout the session or leave it for me to moderate at the end of each talk. What questions we don't get to at the end of each talk, we will get to at the end of the evening the very, very end of the evening, we're gonna say goodbye to our friends on Facebook. We're gonna hit the off button on record. And when we do that, you can ask questions that are not going to be kept forever on the internet. So if there's something that you wanna ask and you're afraid that there's an identifier in there and you just don't want it to be kept forever on the internet, wait till the end of the evening and we'll have an opportunity for you to ask questions privately within the webinar. It's not private. If you're sharing it, whoever's in the webinar is gonna hear the question too, but. Just wanted to make sure we we're clear on that. If you ask a question that's way too specific and it's looking for a consult via webinar, we're gonna generalize your question. We'll address it in concept, but we'll, the doctors are not here tonight to provide you care via Zoom. So if you have questions, ask them, but if it, we don't get as specific as you need, please understand that it's not really possible. Okay, Shep, I've said it all. So you are the... Uh, representative and director of the HCM program over there at your facility in Columbia Presbyterian Medical Center, New York City. Um, so why don't you introduce us to your team? Perfect, thanks so much, Lisa. So I'm gonna get started, uh, as Lisa said, just with an introduction, uh, which I should have some slides uh, to share for that. So just give me a moment, we'll make sure that comes up. We may see Lisa for a second, then my slides. Okay, let's see. Um, you can see the slideshow. You're good. Okay, terrific. All right, so as Lisa mentioned, my name is Shep Weiner. I'm the medical director of the HCM Center uh, at New York Presbyterian Hospital, Columbia University Irving Medical Center. It is a mouthful and that is our official title. Uh, and we're very proud uh, to be here tonight to participate in the HCMA Big Hearted Warriors Unite uh, tour. Um, and you know, we have several talks for you tonight, which we hope are helpful and informative, and uh, we're excited to be here and do this. Uh, I just want to overview and introduce our program a bit before we get started with uh, some of the talks. Uh, so this is where we're located. Uh, we're located in northern Manhattan in Washington Heights at uh, 168th Street and Fort Washington Avenue uh, with a nice view of the, uh, the George Washington Bridge flowing in from New Jersey. 
um, you know, very accessible, although being in the city, you know, close to the highways and the exits. And uh, fortunately, therefore, it makes it a pretty reasonable trip for our patients uh, to come in here and see us. We're located in that glass building, which is the Milstein Family Heart Center on the fourth floor, and that's where uh, we see our HCM patients. Uh, in terms of our program, um, you know, we really do try to fi follow the AHA ACC guidelines for having a comprehensive uh, HCM center, you know, providing all the services, you know, from diagnosis uh, to treatment. And, uh, you know, this is a model that you know, it's taken years for us to kind of develop and utilize all the resources at NYP Columbia, uh, but something that we're proud to, to offer at this point. Uh, it takes a village, um, and you know, tonight uh, here, uh, in addition to myself, I uh, will be joined by our surgical director, Dr. Hiro Takayama, uh, and our research director, Dr. Jay Shimada. Uh, there's obviously a, a lot of other team members behind us uh, that work with us uh, to provide the best possible care for our HCM patients, advance our educational initiatives, advance our, our research initiatives, and some of these folks are, are listed here. Uh, this is me, and then you'll be uh, hearing from Dr. Takayama, uh, and Dr. Shimada as well. Uh, we really do try to take the, the teamwork approach in our HCM model of care, uh, as we find that working together provides the best patient care experience, uh, where we try to coordinate appointment schedules for our patients. And you know, we have all our specialist testing and procedures under one roof. It's a very big roof, uh, but uh, we do have everything here uh, to offer our patients. Uh, a personal physician, you know, meaning me, will, will coordinate each patient's care. Uh, to utilize the resources that are available at Columbia. Uh, communication, collaboration, obviously, between team members is essential, uh, as is respecting individual needs and preferences and using a, a shared decision-making model, uh, especially for some of the more complex decisions that we're faced with HCM. Uh, so this is where we are, uh, and we're proud to you know, now be an official HCMA Center of Excellence. Uh, we were recognized uh, in June of last year, uh, and it's been a pleasure already over the you know, the last six, seven months working with Lisa and her team at the HCMA uh, to continue to advance our own program and that of the care of the HCM community uh, at large. Uh, so I will stop sharing here. And um, Lisa, I don't know if you want me to turn it back to you before I start with uh, the first presentation. I'm gonna turn it back to me for a minute and I'm gonna give everybody some updates because there's a lot going on here at the HCMA. So I'm gonna do my screen share and we're also gonna take a moment to um, acknowledge our, hope. Let, me get my, let me get myself organized, some of our sponsors for this evening's event. And we cut that out and we go over here and we press that button and we go in that one. Okay, <clears throat> I've got all of this set. So I wanna bring you guys up to date on some of the things that are happening here at the HCMA. And I even have late breaking news tonight, people. There's late breaking news. Um, so we have a, a little bit of a new look on our slides for 2023. So you'll see some new things and you'll hear uh, a little bit more about some of our programs in a different way. So this is our agenda for this evening. Um, so we are going to be covering medical management, surgical um, repair, Breakthroughs in research, lots going on there. Exercise in HCM, hot topic always. And we'll be talking about how you can get in touch with uh, the center in uh, Columbia. I like the NYP Columbia. That one strikes me. I can do that one. We just got a lot of names there. So I want to acknowledge we have some new sponsors or change. Some of them are new. Some of them are uh, continuing. But Imbria is uh, a great pharmaceutical company that is doing a clinical trial in HCM right now. And they became a sponsor this year. Tanaya Therapeutics that you're going to hearing a lot more about this year. Bristol Myers Squibbs and Cytokinetics. So we want to thank our sponsors because without them, programs like this would not be possible. So um, I want to bring some key dates and some concepts to your mind as you're starting out this year with us. It's January, we've got 12 months ahead to get a lot done. Um, HCM Awareness Day falls on February 22nd, 2023. Please mark your calendars. We're gonna be sending out some social media graphics that you can start sharing in your social threads to bring everybody to the understanding that we have a, a big event coming up and we're gonna have a webinar that day, and one in the afternoon, one in the evening. I'll talk about that in a second. We know that Heart Month is February. We've got a lot of activities planned for February. You're going to hear about some of them tonight. From March to December, we're going to be launching a new season of HCM Academy, which is medical education. Uh, we will be keeping our Big Hearted Warrior tours, trying to keep it to the third Thursday of each month. Podcast should be every Friday. Okay, one was on Thursday this week. 
at 11 a.m. Eastern time. HCM Act, we're going to talk about tonight. We're bringing back our annual meeting, people. We're coming to it in person again. So we'll have an opportunity for you to join us for a day of education in New Jersey on October 21st and a party that night. We're going to do Unmask the Great Masquerader Part 2. Um, think of it as an opportunity to just relax with your friends, have a little fun. We're going to do some awards, some recognition of our volunteers and some of our partners. So we hope you can join us in New Jersey and on October 21st. That will be in Morristown. And we have great printed materials that's available all year round that you can use to provide information, education, and awareness in your community. So let's talk about Otto. I don't know how many of you have heard about Otto yet, but he's kind of making a big deal to, to me. Um, Tom Hanks plays a character named Otto. Otto's kind of a grouch and he's got some issues and he's had a very complicated life. The movie is not about hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, but Otto, Tom Hanks' character in the movie, has hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. I am going to be honest and tell you that I went to the movie in the pre-release, which was about two weeks ago, expecting to be disappointed in the depiction of HCM because I didn't think they would make it real. Well, I was wrong. Tom Hanks is just phenomenal. And his depiction of somebody with HCM, you're not all grouches. Please don't take it that I'm calling you grouches because Otto is kind of a grouchy guy. But people don't understand what his lived experience has been. HCM happens in his life quite early. He's diagnosed young, but other things happen. But as all these other things are happening, good and bad things, HCM is ever present and you can see it in his character if you understand life with the disease. There are some triggering scenes in the movie, like his father does die, just putting it out there because I don't want people to be upset when they see it. And he has some episodes that are filmed in such a way that they are going to resonate very closely with you and your families because they're things that we experience on a daily basis. But it's our opportunity to highlight HCM in a way that we've never had before. So um, for those of you in the New York, New Jersey area who are either members or have made donations or volunteered in the past year, um, you received an email with an invitation. Um, so if you're in the area and you are able to show up on February 2nd in Morristown, New Jersey, we will have a few free tickets available for people to come join us for a movie. We're even buying the popcorn and the soda. Right? Don't tell your doctors you're eating popcorn and soda, but that's okay. Once in a while, you know, once in a while. So what we're going to do at the end of this movie is we're going to have a discussion session about how did it impact you? We're going to hear from some people's life's experiences to see how it mirrored the movie. We're inviting some media members, lawmakers, patients, and physicians. We want to start a conversation. If this one works well, we're going to do one in California as well and possibly uh, one in D.C., so if you're in the area and you've gotten an invitation, if you're watching and you didn't get an invitation, you can call the office and inquire and we'll see if there's space available. Um, it's We've never done anything like this before. We're kind of making it up as we go along, but we wanted to take this opportunity to share this moment with you. And we thank our sponsors, Tanaya, Bristol, Myers, Squibb, and Cytokinetics for their support of this endeavor. And we're partnering with the Atlantic Healthcare System, Marstown HCM program, because it's in their backyard. Um, so. Come learn about Otto. We have another program. As many of you saw uh, earlier this month, there was a wonderful save of a football player, um, Damar Hamlin, who probably got a chest blow that caused his cardiac arrest. We're not sure about the cause yet, but that doesn't matter. The fact is that somebody went down in cardiac arrest and he survived because of prompt response, good CPR, and prompt use of an external defibrillator. I did something this week that I haven't done in a long time. I went back and I looked at the video from March 4th, 1990. Many of you have no idea what that date is. It's the date that Hank Gathers had his cardiac arrest and died. And if you look at the response to when Hank Gathers went down in 1990, no cell phones, no AEDs. Maybe we had CPR if people started to do it in time. 
but this poor man went down, 22 years old, and they held his hand as he passed. And we didn't know any better. We knew better for Damar. And they had hands on him in 10 seconds and they started resuscitation. And that's the difference in survival versus not surviving. So back in 2010, we created a program called Drill Dr. Hart. So we thought of it for sports teams, like they're going to drill a play. And my nephew and I actually created the content that became Drill Dr. Hart. He was a USA volleyball coach and collegiate coach and a teacher. And he had witnessed a cardiac arrest when he was 13 years old. It was his mother. So we created a program and it kind of got sunsetted and it was in the background. Well, we've rekindled it and we put a 2023 flare on it. And now we have a new website for it. Uh, we're going to be issuing a challenge. Let me tell you what that's about. So what Drill Dr. Hart is, it's not CPR and AED training. It's preparing for the event when it happens and knowing your role in the event or knowing how to run an event if it happens. Who's calling 911? Is there an AED on premise? Who knows CPR? What are the laws in your state regarding who can do CPR or use the AED? You have a planning session with your team, your school, your coach, your house of worship, your place of business. Wherever you are, you have a plan. You create the drill. You practice the drill. And now here's the challenge. You film the drill. You post the drill to our media challenge, social media challenge. And the organization with the most votes, meaning likes, clicks, and engagements, is going to win a free AED for their organization. So what you're going to do is you're going to come to the website under programs and you're going to see Drill Dr. Hart. It'll tell you to download the drill. It's a PDF. You're going to click to take the challenge. You can register for the challenge and upload your film. And you can learn a little bit about the history. You can also get a little bit of education and you can hear what Dr. Mart Matt Martinez had to say in a recent interview about preparedness. So it's 911, CPR, AED, help the EMTs get to your location and get that patient to advance life support as quickly as possible. If you can do all of these steps for your house of worship, education, team, or business, each class has the opportunity of winning an AED. Small businesses only, teams, you define it, recreational, competitive, we don't care. As long as it's a team and you're filming it, the device will go to the organization. So there'll be some forms to fill out but you can win an AED if you, if you try. So we're gonna be launching this in a couple of days officially. It's kind of a dry, launch, you know, soft launch right now. But if you have any questions, do call us and we'll be happy to get you involved. Our month is coming up, Awareness Day is coming up. This is going to be our HCM Awareness Day uh, logo for this year. So we're gonna ask you all to share it. We're going to create frames again. You can use your frame from last year if you have one for social media. If you want one, we're going to have a process where you can get a frame because social media doesn't allow that anymore to just put them on. We'll do it for you. Send your picture and we'll get you a frame. So we can raise awareness all month together with that frame. So we also created a new t-shirt. And to kind of tie in to auto, we've made a t-shirt that says, not all of those with HCM are grouchy like auto. It's a conversation starter and it's got the cute little HCM Awareness Day logo on the back. We have a women's cut. We have a general unisex tee. So you can come go online right now and put the orders in. Um, they're not in yet. We'll be sending them out as soon as we get them, which should be around the 2nd of February. Um, on February 22nd, we are going to have online content. So you can register to join us in a webinar on that day. Um, so. I want to talk about some legislative activities. You've heard me talk a little bit over the past two years about moving with, forward with the Healthy Cardiac Monitoring Act. We had to get a lot of ducks in a row to, to get this effort moving and get the language that we needed and get it vetted with all of the organizations we needed to do that with. It is ready for prime time now. Um, so what we're looking to do is in, improve the diagnostic process by asking um, questions in the well child examination that family heart health history and symptoms in the child and also providing professional education. So we're gonna be doing call blocks on that and we're gonna be asking lawmakers to act on that, but we're engaging them with another step first. 
And that is what I call HCM awareness resolutions, proclamations and laws. Oh my. So we've been doing a lot of work behind the scenes. And I'm happy to say that we have a few laws, a few, a few proclamations and a resolution heading out of committee onto the full vote. So New Jersey, Ohio, Connecticut, Texas came in today. So thank you, Texas. And Utah, we got out of committee yesterday. We need awareness resolutions to start the conversation. Why is HCM important? What do people need to know? This is how we start having the conversation with lawmakers that we need to do something more like the HCM Act. If you want to look at our website or email Julie, she can send you a link to what's called our UJOIN site where you can just write to your state elected officials with one little push of a button and we'll send it out to everybody for you. And then we can help follow up and make sure that that lawmaker has heard your voice. So, you know, we're doing the Big Hearted Warrior Tour. I don't know why this slide is in here because we're doing it right now and I was in a hurry. Um, so we want you all to be using your social this year in, in new ways as we go into HCM Awareness Month. We do have our HCM Hero of the Day that we're going to be featuring each day of the month. You can share that on your feed as well as just sharing your general awareness piece as well as your personal story as much as you're comfortable in sharing on social please share. That's where we're going to get volume coming back to us to learn about things like the HCM Act and the Drill Dr. Heart program. Um, you're going to see an example of our partnership, one of our partnerships coming out probably in the next couple of days. So we're working with the partnership to advance cardiovascular health, and we've come up with some co-branded materials, including this, it's kind of like a reel. So if you wanted to tell a story or use reels on social, there's four steps. There's actually a video that goes after this. I'm sorry, I didn't put it on here. But this is to let people know what the symptoms are, how to get screened, how to get treated for HCM. So you can share those on your social platform too. We do our Tales from the Heart podcast. I just wanted to show off our new logo for season three. We're excited about logo changes and freshening things up. This morning, I had a really lovely chat with one of my podcast partners, Alex DeFeria. Um, Alex is a unique individual in that I've known his family since he was 15, and now he's Dr. Alex, and he's an HCM physician at UPenn. He also had a myectomy himself and comes from a very um, you know, impacted family. And we talk about planning your year, and he shares some updates from his family, and there might have been some tears. Um, but it's a real story and I'd encourage you to go watch Tales from the Heart from today. Um, it was really quite a day. If you have not heard yet, we have the Lori Travel Fund, which means if you are in financial need and you need resources to get to a center of excellence or a transplant program for HCM care, you can apply for micro travel grants and we will provide up to $600 per year per person to assist you in getting to the center of excellence of your choice. There's a form to fill out. You can submit. We've already paid a couple grants out. We're really happy about that. But we have money here, people. We'd like to give it away to you if you need it to get to a center. It'll pay for trains, planes, automobiles, hotel rooms, food on the road. So if you need some help, please do not hesitate to apply. Um, and if you are not a member right now and you think membership services would be beneficial to you, like an extended navigation call, our books and our training materials that we send to you, you can apply for a uh, scholarship. We've got generous people out there who have put a number of them in the hopper and they're waiting to be claimed. I just processed one today. Gabby, you're getting a scholarship. So there we go. Um, printed materials. If you want to distribute printed materials in a community, all you need to do is drop us an email and say, I'm interested in sending out some information or posting posters in a doctor's office or in a health facility, and we'll send you printed material so you can go out and post those. Journals are for members only. Um, new late breaking news. We're working on our first magazine. So it's going to be called Upbeat. See what we did there? Upbeat. And you're going to have HCM patient stories inside, HCM factoids, information, Items about research, clinical trials, life with HCM, tips, recipes, all kinds of fun stuff. And we're thinking that we're going to do two editions per year. 
our center of excellence partners will be able to use this too and they can co-brand it with us and put the stories of their patients in there so um, i'm going to leave it there that's kind of the highlights of everything that's new and exciting there's other things going on but my mind's going to explode this is our team nothing happens in a silo here everything happens because we have an amazing team doing amazing work for you every day um, this is how to contact us this is our email website social handles you know how to find us there and i just want to say thank you to our partners at nyp columbia i like that it's so much easier to say and all of our center of excellence partners our staff our board our volunteers and of course to brandy my donor please remember to sign your organ donation uh, cards or the back of your license because you never know when you're going to be on which side of the organ donation situation. It's really important you let your families know your, think your thinking and your perspective. Now I'm going to shut up for the rest of the night and let Columbia talk to you. Okay. Thanks so much, Lisa. It's really always so impressive to uh, hear all the things that are happening within the HCMA. And like I said, a reason why we're so excited to, to be part of it now is a, a center of excellence. So. Just gonna bring up uh, the slides here um, for my first presentation. Okay, Shep, we lost your camera. I don't know what happened. I think Shep hit the wrong button. Uh-oh. Hello, Shep. Uh-oh. Anybody in the building with him? <laughs> yeah, I'm texting him. Okay. You can text him and tell him he just went radio silent. Oh, he's reconnecting. Me too. There you are. Uh, yeah, so I... And there he goes. Well... We try to practice a screen share thing and occasionally it fails. <clears throat> okay. Never a dull moment. You hope for a few in a row, but they don't tend to happen very often. Oh, Jeff's coming back in. Sorry, I'm, I'm back. Can you, I'm not quite sure what happened there. Um, We'll uh, try to bring up the slides again without uh, disconnecting me. So let's give it another shot here. Okay, one second. Okay, you are in twice, and I don't know how you did that. Okay, can you hear me or not? I can hear you. I can see you, and then I am going to. I'm afraid if I remove the other one, it's going to just disappear. So right, we're just going to leave it like this. Yeah, as long as. Okay, let's try that. Hold on. Okay. All right, uh, can, you can see the slides at this point. Yes, but you're not in presentation mode. Now you are. Okay, Perfect. we're good to go. All, All right, so little little excitement there before we get started. Um, so I'll be talking about the medical management of obstructive HCM, an exciting time for HCM patients and HCM doctors for about the next 15 minutes or so. Um, and it really is an exciting time. People have heard me talk before, know that I say that, and that uh, I really do mean it because we're at a, a point now where our ability to improve the quality of life of our patients with obstructive HCM are, are much more significant than what they've been historically due to new medication options. And I'm happy to have the opportunity to, to highlight that uh, this evening. So we'll just quickly review a little bit of obstructive HCM background, uh, talk about the important traditional medical therapy that we've been using for years, and then focus on some of the novel medical therapies that we have available now and how we put this together with the NYP Columbia approach. So in terms of obstructive HCM, uh, most of you are familiar you know, with a transthoracic echocardiogram uh, shown here is the typical parasternal long axis view where you have the intraventricular septum um, uh, shown here. And uh, this is your typical asymmetric uh, septal hypertrophy. Uh, when we add uh, spectral Doppler uh, imaging uh, to our echo, that's how we estimate uh, pressure by first uh, detecting the velocity through the left ventricular outflow tract, uh, and then with a modified Bernoulli's equation, convert that to pressure, and you'll see on your echo reports, your peak you know, LVOT gradient with Valsalva uh, is 55, 60 millimeters of mercury. That's how we derive those values, and that's obstructive HCM. In terms of the pre prevalence of LV outflow tract obstruction in HCM patients, it's generally recognized that 
about 70% or a little bit more than two thirds of HCM patients will be obstructive, uh, leaving a third that are not obstructive. What we're talking about here today is for obstructive HCM. Of that two thirds, it kind of splits evenly uh, where half or a third of all the patients uh, will have an obstruction at rest. And then another uh, third of the total patient population will be uh, obstructed with provocation with exercise. And, and we rely a lot on stress echo uh, at the NYP Columbia HCM Center both to objectify functional capacity and also to kind of search or hunt for obstruction, which may not be seen on a resting echocardiogram to identify patients who may have obstructive physiology and may benefit from, from new therapies. Uh, in terms of traditional medical therapy, uh, you know, what your doctor would likely do with you in the beginning is just uh, review medications that you may be on to treat other heart conditions, you know, coronary artery disease, hypertension, uh, even non-cardiac conditions like benign prostatic hypertrophy, you know, these medications, which are very helpful in those settings, can sometimes potentiate the physiology of obstruction and worsen symptoms. So it's very careful to do, you know, full medica medication reconciliation uh, to see if there's anything that needs to be adjusted to improve obstructive physiology. In terms of the traditional medications that we use, most of you probably take a, a beta blocker or, or know people that are on a beta blocker. Um, and the data for that, you know, have been around for a while. I mean, you know, a few years after the initial description of idiopathic hypertrophic uh, subaortic sclerosis, as it was initially known, uh, beta blockers were being used. Most of these data are single arm prospective studies, uh, very small numbers, uh, but we know in our practice that beta blockers you know, will improve symptoms uh, and sometimes you know, actually lower gradients. And you wanna be aggressive with the beta blocker, getting a resting heart rate down into the 50s. Uh, similarly, the non-dihydropyrin calcium channel blockers, such as verapamil, uh, also been studied for decades. Again, not very high levels of evidence, but the studies have shown benefit and we've seen that clinically uh, either as an add-on to a beta blocker or uh, in, in, instead of a beta blocker, patients have uh, side effects uh, to beta blockade. Uh, the other medication that's been used is disopyramide, a class A, 1A antiarrhythmic. Uh, a lot of the, the work with this has been done uh, in New York at NYU by Dr. Mark Sherrod. Uh, we'll go over uh, some of those data briefly. Uh, but disopyramide uh, has been a, a helpful adjunct uh, in terms of improving symptoms and decreasing obstruction uh, in patients with residual symptoms despite beta blocker or verapamil. Uh, there's an immediate release and a controlled release formulation uh, usually used with a beta blocker or verapamil, uh, sometimes limited by side effects, specifically anticholinergic side effects, uh, which you can take mestinon to help mitigate that. Uh, and then traditionally, the disopyramide uh, was given as an inpatient uh, for QTC monitoring. Uh, but more recently, there's data suggesting that it's you know, start to, uh, safe to start as an outpatient um, when uh, you have appropriate follow-up. Uh, so this was one of the studies by Dr. Sherrod looking at disopyramide as an add-on uh, to patients who had symptomatic obstruction that was unresponsive to beta blockade of verapamil. Uh, 221 patients um, got disopyramide. A smaller number went on for invasive cephal reduction. Of the patients who received disopyramide, about two-thirds um, had symptomatic improvement and continued pharmacologic therapy, and that you know, mirrors our, our clinical experience uh, with disopyramide as well. Uh, in terms of the novel medical therapy, and I think this is really where, where the excitement comes in, um, so long, uh, for so long patients with HCM you know, felt okay, uh, but now I think we really have the ability to make people feel well, and, and we can do that uh, with some of the medications that are now available. Uh, specifically speaking about cardiac myosin modulation, or Mavicampton, uh, Mavicampton is an orally administered small molecule modulator of cardiac myosin that really targets the underlying biochemical abnormalities in obstructive HCM. Um, so what uh, Mavicampton will do is it will affect that myosin actin cross bridging, which is responsible for the hypercontractility uh, and hypertrophy uh, that we see uh, in HCM. Um, the initial preclinical animal data uh, did show that it prevented hypertrophy, reduced myocyte disarray and interstitial fibrosis compared to placebo. Uh, which led to phase one studies, which showed that it was generally safe across a range of doses, uh, leading to the Pioneer HCM, which was the open label non-randomized phase two trial uh, that was published in the Annals of Internal Medicine back in 2019. Uh, there were two cohorts of Mavicampton, a higher dose cohort and a lower dose cohort. And what was seen was that Mavicampton reduced LV alpha tract obstruction and improved exercise capacity and symptoms. Uh, so this really led to the landmark trial, the Explorer HCM study, uh, which we were fortunate to be an investigator site at Columbia enrolling two patients into the trial. And this was the randomized double-blind placebo-controlled phase three trial 
uh, which was really a high level of evidence uh, for HCM in general and, and specifically uh, for Mavic Hampton that subsequently led to uh, FDA approval. Uh, this was presented at the ESC and, and published uh, simultaneously in The Lancet uh, in 2020. Uh, so for, for Explore HCM, these were uh, obstructive HCM patients who were at least 18 years old. Uh, ejection fraction had to be normal, greater than 55%. Uh, with gradients uh, of greater than 50 at rest or with exercise or greater than 30 with Valsalva. Class two or three symptom patients, uh, the majority were class two and about a, a little under a third were class three NYHA functional class patients. Uh, and patients that were enrolled had to have the ability to perform an upright CPET. Uh, cardiopulmonary exercise testing was part of the composite uh, primary endpoint uh, in Explore HCM. Uh, subjects were excluded if they had a, an HCM mimicker or a phenocopy. Uh, if they had a history of recent syncope or sustained VT uh, with exercise within six months, uh, and if there was a history of resuscitated cardiac arrest at any time or an appropriate ICD discharge for a ventricular arrhythmia within six months. Uh, a minority of patients in uh, Explore HCM did have defibrillators, but they just could not have had uh, recent therapy. Uh, proximal, or proximal or persistent AFib at the time of screening, um, or a fib um, not treated with anticoagulation for at least four weeks prior to screening or not adequately rate controlled within six months. And if patients were on disopyramide um, or renolazine, uh, they were not included in Explore HCM. Uh, in terms of what these uh, patients look like, uh, the mean age was in the upper 50s at uh, 58 years old. Uh, the majority were men, but 35 to 46% of the subjects were women. Uh, it was a very predominant uh, Caucasian study. Uh, 89 to 93 percent of patients uh, were white, and other minority groups made up of just a small number of patients included. Uh, the majority of patients, 43 percent of patients, came from the USA. Uh, total, I think, 16 countries, and, and Spain and Poland contributed a, a significant number of patients as well. Uh, genetic testing had been performed in about 75 percent of patients with a pathogenic uh, HCM gene variant identified in about 20 to 30 uh, percent of patients. Um, although AFib at the time of screening was excluded, there was prior AFib in 10 to 18 percent of patients. Uh, a small number of patients, six to nine percent, have actually had prior septal reduction therapy. We will hear from Dr. Takayama and hear uh, how successful septal reduction therapy can be, uh, but sometimes, uh, you know, there can be some residual obstruction or symptoms, and, and those patients were included. Uh, and then there were, you know, patients who had other comorbid cardiac conditions, hypertension, dyslipidemia, coronary artery disease, obesity, type 2 diabetes, and about 5 to 30 percent of patients. Uh, importantly, uh, most patients that were enrolled in Explore HCM were either on a beta blocker or calcium channel, channel blocker to begin with, uh, upwards of 95 percent uh, in the treatment group. So 75 percent of patients were on a beta blocker, and Mavicampton was added to that, and about 13 to 20 percent of patients were on a calcium channel blocker, and Mavicampton was added to that. They were not on both, but they were on one or the other in a majority of cases. 22 to 23 percent of patients had an ICD in place, um, and uh, like I said, the majority were, were class two. Moving over to the right side, 72, 74 percent, about 26, 20 percent were functional class three, um, and EF uh, was normal and kind of the typical super normal 74 percent uh, average EF uh, in the hypercontractile obstructive HCM state. Uh, here are the results of Explore HCM. So taking on the top left, looking at figure A. Uh, you see the post-exercise LVOT gradient um, at the start of the trial and after the 30-week treatment period. And in the Mavic Hampton group, uh, the post-exercise LVOT gradient, which was about 85 to start with, dropped uh, to 38. Uh, and placebo uh, did not have a significant change. Importantly, the post-exercise LVOT gradient dropped below 50, which is generally our threshold uh, for recommending septal reduction therapy. If you look at resting LVOT gradient and Valsalva LVOT gradient showed in, uh, shown in figure C and D, you'll see within four weeks of therapy with Mavicampton, you had a significant drop in both the resting LVOT gradient and the Valsalva gradient, and this was maintained throughout the treatment period uh, compared to placebo. Uh, up uh, in figure B, uh, you're shown the ejection fraction in both placebo and the Mavicampton group. There was no change in placebo. Uh, in the Mavicampton Mavic group, on average, uh, the ejection fraction did drop by 4%, and there was a small number of patients, seven patients, that had a drop of EF to less than 50% uh, between uh, 35 and 49, with a median of 48%, uh, which improved after stopping uh, the study drug uh, for a few weeks. Uh, biomarkers were also looked at in Explore HCM secondary endpoints. 
Uh, you saw a drop in N pro BNP as well as troponin I, uh, again, markers of, of wall stress. Uh, shown graphically on the right side of the slide, uh, Mavicampin essentially uh, converted a NYH functional class two to three population into a, a one and two population uh, compared to placebo with very significant uh, st statistical significance throughout all the endpoints looked at in the study. Uh, this led to FDA approval of Mavicampin in, on April 28, 2022, uh, through a REMS program, which is an FDA program, a risk evaluation mitigation strategy. Uh, this is a program that the FDA employs uh, for medications where they want uh, access to be somewhat restricted uh, for potential safety concerns. Uh, so because of that reduction in ejection fraction in a few of the patients treated with Mavicampin, uh, patients who are started with Mavicampin or, or commercial Camzios uh, will come back for follow-up at week four, week eight, and week 12 uh, for a clinical follow-up and an echocardiogram to assess their ejection fraction for safety and also to check their Valsalva LVOT peak gradient for efficacy. Um, we at NYP Columbia have had a lot of experience with the Camzios Mavicampin over the last six, seven plus months. Um, and really have had found it to be quite beneficial and have not had any safety concerns. Uh, so the REMS program, if people have questions about it, you know, something we can discuss. Um, but the way I look at it is it, it keeps it safe um, and there's really no concern about it. And some of the, the, the CAMZIOS, Mavicampton follow-ups have been very rewarding. Patients coming in feeling better, uh, happy to come and make that commitment, make sure there's no safety issues. After that initiation phase of the first 12 weeks, if there's, if there's no dose change, uh, it's coming back every 12 weeks thereafter. Uh, important to mention Afficampton, which is a second generation cardiac myosin inhibitor by Cytokinetics. Uh, the Redwood HCM phase two clinical trial was presented at the Heart Failure Society of America meeting uh, in September of 21. And then it was just published actually two weeks ago in, in JAK. Um, and that was also a, a positive study. Um, some speculate that there are favorable pharmacokinetics in terms of a shorter half-life and wider therapeutic window compared to Mavicampton. And the phase three clinical trial for Afficampton, the Sequoia HCM trial is now enrolling. Uh, we're also a site for that, investigator site for that trial up here at NYP Columbia. And so far we've uh, in successfully screened and enrolled two patients uh, in that trial. Um, so after reviewing that, how do you put this all together? Uh, you know, a very important document uh, was published in December of 2020, uh, just about two years ago, which was an update uh, AHA ACC guideline for the diagnosis and treatment of patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Uh, the first, you know, practice guideline update since 2011 and had significant um, strides uh, that were reported in really all aspects of management of uh, HCM. Uh, Mavicampton uh, was approved after these guidelines um, and the guidelines do nicely take you through how you manage an obstructive uh, HCM patient who's symptomatic. Uh, like we talked about, avoiding vasodilators, starting with a beta blocker and, or verapamil, uh, diltiazem, calcium channel blocker, and then what happens if symptoms persist. And this is really where we, we see the use of Mavicampin and Camzios. Generally, we'll have our patients on a beta blocker uh, or a calcium channel blocker. And if the symptoms persist, rather than you know tweaking the doses of, of the beta blocker or the verapamil for years and years and years, we'll have a quick trigger uh, to consider the Mavicampin, and we found it to be very helpful. Uh, if you're on both a beta blocker and a calcium channel blocker, one will be stopped before you start Mavicampin, as, as I mentioned in Explorer, patients were not on, on both those therapies when Mavicampin is started. Uh, so that's really where we see it fitting in, and it's had a, a huge benefit uh, for our patients in the last six plus months. Um, so that's what uh, I have now, and I'll come out of the share. So while you were speaking, I launched a poll to have people tell us a little bit about what their perspective is so we understand exactly who's in the audience. So if you have not taken the poll yet, please do so so that when we're answering the questions, we keep them on target to the community that we're talking to at any particular time. Um, so we'll give everybody a few minutes on that. And we do have a question in the oh, um, questions for me, not for you. Uh, Cheryl, you're on a fixed income, social security disability. Uh, you can apply for a scholarship. Um, so just apply for a scholarship and we'll be happy to assist you. Um, so you're good. So there we go. Uh, if we have any questions for, for Shep before we go on, here we go. Would you be stopped from taking 
I'm sorry, would you be stopped to start Affy Campton? Okay, I had to, had to get the spelling there. Um, and would you have to be on a beta blocker, calcium ch channel blocker, or is it going to be stopped? Uh, what, what is the onboarding for the Affy trial? Yeah, so uh, there's the option of, of being on background therapy or not. Um, you know, generally, you know, the, the patients that you know, we've enrolled, we haven't stopped or started therapy. Um, you know, they've had uh, symptoms. Our patients happen to be on, on beta blockers. Um, but, uh, and, that, and that's been our approach. And also with Mavicampton, Camzios, you know, for that initiation phase, we'll usually leave patients on the beta blocker or the calcium channel blocker. Mavicampton itself really doesn't have much hemodynamic effect on heart rate or blood pressure. What we've seen after we've moved past that initiation phase where patients feel better, their gradients are reduced, the question comes, well, do you still need that higher dose of, you know, metoclolol or, or verapamil? Uh, unless it's being used for another purpose, we've actually, if there's some side effects from those medications, we've actually reduced those doses and uh, have been successful with that. Uh, but that's really after the initiation phase. We're, we're leaving things the same and, and, and true of the, the clinical trial for Sequoia. Okay, so we have another question. We have a couple of questions here. So we'll go through a couple of questions and if we start running long, excuse me, hiccups. <laughs> um, if we start running long, then we will use the questions at the end of the evening. Sure. Um, so do you believe that they're saying Navicampton, but I'm gonna qualify this to be myosin inhibitors as a class, have any value for obstructive HCM patients who are asymptomatic but have a significant gradient. And I'm going to qualify that with an observation from 28 years on the front line and 40 years as a patient and then some. We don't always understand what symptoms are because we think our normal is normal, but our normal may not actually be normal because the only thing we have to judge that upon is how we feel and we only have the hearts that we have. So it's kind of hard to say what you would feel like if you didn't have HCM. So symptomatic, asymptomatic is kind of complicated for us. So I will just put that out there as a point to be considered, but what do you think about using a myosin inhibitor for the purposes of just lowering gradient? Yeah, That's a great point, Lisa. And I'll, sometimes I'll ask patients when they come in, I say, when's the last time you felt normal? And I'm usually met with maybe a, a chuckle or a laugh because to your point, people say, this is just how I feel. I, I don't necessarily remember what normal is. This is what I do. Um, as I mentioned earlier, you know, we do rely a lot on stress echo to quantitate uh, objectively you know, functional exercise capacity, recognizing that's just one day. And as you know, uh, the symptomatology of, of HCM can change minute to minute, day to day. Um, but that's a really good point. You know, are you really asymptomatic or are you not? Uh, to be clear, you know, the FDA approval of Mavicampton is for a symptomatic class two to three obstructive HCM patients, and that's who we're using the medication for. If you look at some of the, the exploratory secondary endpoints and other analyses that have been done in the Explorer trial, including a cardiac MRI substudy, uh, there do seem to be favorable uh, effects on the underlying substrate of HCM, which is you know, what you'd expect based on the mechanism of action of cardiac myosin inhibitors. Uh, also, echo substudies looking at LV uh, mass index and also looking at left atrial volume improvement. Um, so personally, I believe that there probably is a benefit to cardiac myosin in inhibition in patients without symptoms. That's not been proven yet, uh, and it's not available to be used in that capacity. Uh, I think that would be a wonderful future you know, for HCM patients to potentially have a therapy that could slow progression um, or even prevent you know, phenotypic expression in patients who are genotypically positive. I mean, that's maybe science fiction right now, but I think that's where hopefully the field is headed. Um, but now to be clear, we're using it to relieve symptoms, but there do seem to be favorable data to suggest uh, that there may be more to it than that. I would add to this that pressure gradients, pressure inside of your heart, generally not a good thing. It's not supposed to be there. And if the anatomy isn't supposed to have that level of pressure, over time, damage can occur to the mitral valve. You can get regurg, you can dilate out your left atria, and then you've got the downstream consequences of being at a higher risk for atrial fibrillation, potentially, and other risks. So should we be 
I've, I've kind of been stuck on here and Hero's going to talk about myectomy in a few minutes, but when you think about the, what anatomy is supposed to be and what HCM anatomy is, wouldn't it be better if nobody had a gradient, you know, just better for, you know, the heart's still stiff and it's still got some, maybe some diastolic dysfunction, inability to relax, but sh don't we really kind of want to get rid of gradients whenever we see them, whether they're causing a symptom right now or not? Where do you guys think about that? Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with you. I mean, sometimes I'm fascinated by the patients who have you know, very high gradients and, and truly do seem asymptomatic. Um, you know, we have, you know, two goals in, in medicine, one to make people feel better and one to make them live longer. Uh, so if they're truly asymptomatic, you, you can't make them feel any better. But the question is, well, if you leave these gradients untreated, are you potentially going to develop some of the sequelae that um, you mentioned in terms of the, the comorbidities that come from HCM? And yeah, it seems like there's biologic plausibility for that. And I think the story is just starting in terms of you know what the cardiac myosin inhibitors role will be, hopefully, in in uh, reducing you know that that progression. Hero, what do you think? Should gradients just all go away? Yeah, the, no, I, I do agree with the chef. I think the you know, ultimately what we want is a happy patient. It may not be necessarily happy heart. Having said that, you no know, chef and I share many patients you know, who come for surgical myectomy ended up with being you no know, chef's patient for years uh, being managed medic medically. And some of them do come back for surgery for a variety of reasons. And ultimately in some patients, anatomical repair is, uh, is, it is needed. So there will be continue to be a role of anatomical repair. Okay, we have a couple of other questions down the CAMS IOS pathway here. Um, if somebody were taking disapiramide, I, I will qualify that with potentially Norpace CR as well. How long do they need to wash out of Daiso before they start CAMS IOS? Yeah, so it's interesting. I mean, data that I didn't show um, from the, the Valor HCM study, which was uh, presented at ACC last spring, there was a small number of patients who were on disopyramide uh, in addition to the CAMS IOS, and it didn't seem to be an issue. Again, the FDA approval does not uh, include you know, using CAMS IOS in patients on disopyramide. So, um, yes, there, there should be a washout. I mean, we generally will do about you know three days or so. Um, you know, those can be a little bit challenging of a couple days for patients. Um, you know, once the, the Valor uh, results were, you know, presented and published, it makes you more comfortable about the idea of having a shorter washout, but you should do that. Um, and, you know, one question that comes up too is, well, if I'm on disopyramide, but it's also been suppressing my AFib, you know, what's the, what's the role of switching over to CAMS? I was actually saw a patient, I think it was on Tuesday, um, who had more frequent AFib, was started on disopyramide nor pace. The AFib had settled down, but they still came to us with class three symptoms and a, a Valsalva peak gradient of 90. So, you know, their HCM obstruction wasn't adequately being treated with the disopyramide, but the AFib seemed to be. Um, so that, you know, is a very nuanced individual decision. You know, getting back to Lisa's point, if you're relieving obstruction, uh, decreasing left atrial diastolic pressure, you know, there's at least a theoretical thought that, you know, maybe you're actually going to, you know, favorably uh, reduce any potential substrate for AFib. Again, that hasn't been shown. I've had a couple of patients where I've had them come off disopyramide uh, onto Camzios, and so far over the last four or five months, there hasn't been uh, an increase in AFib that we've observed in our anecdotal small number of patients. About how many patients do you have on right now? So we have 16 patients on Camzios. So again, small numbers, but uh, but you know, compared to other programs, you know, doing pretty well, I think, in terms of getting the therapy out. And like I said, you know, since we've been involved as an investigator site for Explorer, our two patients who are now anyone who's an Explorer is in a long-term extension in LTE. I think those patients are coming back for their week 130 echo uh, next week. So they've been on treatment for you know two and a half years at this point. As of right now, there's about 4,000 patients worldwide. Um, taking CAMS IOS as labeled indication. And I know I keep getting the questions, what about the non-obstructives? Those trials are coming and baby steps, we're all learning together. Um, are there side effects to myosin inhibitors that we've identified? So the side effects reported in Explore HCM were dizziness in about 20%, 
and then a small incidence of syncope and a, a few percent. Uh, we haven't seen that. Uh, generally, a lot of our patients come to us dizzy anyway, and they actually feel better on the Kansios. Um, but when I start it, uh, that's what I'll tell people to look out for. But generally, it's very well tolerated. Um, and in my experience, a much you know more favorable side effect profile than, than disopyramide. Uh, it's typically start as a five milligram capsule. It's once a day. Uh, it's usually taken in the morning with or without respect to food. Uh, so pretty easy to take. You do have to be aware of drug-drug interactions. Um, it does uh, affect certain cytochrome and, and SIP mechanisms. Um, and the, the specialty pharmacies that help us uh, dispense Camzios have been helpful in, in reviewing those issues with patients and, and hasn't been uh, anything that's been a, a barrier to taking it. So that you have to be aware of as well. I just put a little asterisk on that. Uh, Paxlovid for COVID is a contraindication, correct? Yeah. Yeah. So I, you know, I'm, I mean, I'm not going to get yeah, started on it generally, but yeah, I mean, the PAX, exactly. I, I, I wouldn't recommend it. Unfortunately, in our experience, you are, and for most patients, you know, being in New York, you know, think about what we were doing almost three years ago. Um, you know, fortunately, most patients with COVID are getting better with or without Paxlovid. So I, I don't think not taking that uh, is, a, is an issue if you're, if you're on the, on the Camzios. It Camzios came out, Paxlovid came out, and there was a little bit of a confusion. I got a lot of questions about that, so I'm just handling it here in webinar format, like yeah. educated people. Okay, so we got the, those. We are going to pause with the rest of these questions. Um, Cheryl, I don't think that that requires an answer. That was just a clarifier, so thank you for that. Um, oh, we'll just do one more, and then we'll clear them out. Have you sure. noticed any positive cardiac changes with the use of Mavicamptin, like wall thickness, uh, scarring in animal studies or in clinical practice? Yeah, so, um, you know, the cardiac MRI sub-study of Explore did seem to have a, a decrease in late gadolinium enhancement or, or scar or fibrosis. Um, in our own experience with our, our clinical echoes, I mean, we haven't, you know, seen any uh, changes in LV mass index, although that was also reported uh, in Explore. Uh, the thing that I'm also paying attention to is the degree of mitral regurgitation. Uh, that just again, in my own anecdotal experience, you know, we seem to be seeing a, a decrease in in SAM mediated mitral regurgitation as we improve obstruction, which again isn't that surprising. Um, so uh, that's something that we we've seen on our echoes. Uh, when patients are taking camzios, they're, they're principally coming back to assess the LV ejection fraction and the the Valsalva peak LVOT gradient. We'll still do full echoes on those patients and, and look at other parameters, including mitral regurgitation. Okay, we are going to wrap that up and I'm just going to look at the poll real quick. So you know who we're talking to. 64% of our viewers are in the Northeast, 7% Southeast, some are out West, got 14% there. And we've got a couple Canadians with us tonight. Nobody from other parts of the world. What is your relationship to HCM? We have 64% are patients, 14% are patients, and have a family member, 14% have a family member, 7% have a close friend. You're a good friend, thank you. Um, all right, just gotta give him a shout out for being a good friend. Uh, how many, have you or your family member had any of the following? Um, so we have 36% are diagnosed within the last two years. And we know those first two to three years of diagnosis, there's a lot to process. Go slow, we're here for you. 93% um, are on meds. 36% have an ICD, 29% have had septal reduction therapy, 21% have atrial fibrillation, 21% of us have lost a family member to HCM, 50% had genetic testing, and right now 43% uh, are considering a new medication device or surgery at this time and 57 are not considering anything. So we got some people shopping here tonight, people. They wanna know what their options are, okay. So those are the results and oops, I didn't really mean to do that. So we're going to close that out. And who's up next? I believe is Hero up next? Who's up next? I don't have my agenda in front of me. I got to go pull my agenda. Yeah, certainly I can go. Okay. And, you can uh, go. Let me share my screen. Absolutely. Okay. Get yourself in present mode and we're good to go. You're on a Mac. All right, uh, good night, every, uh, every, good evening, everybody. Um, uh, thank you very much, Lisa, for allowing us to present in this uh, uh, very um, interactive session. We are very excited. 
and listen and I go back for, how, for many years and we've been long years trying to be part of your association and finally we are here. Um, the you know, Lisa has been guiding us to make our center better and better. And I, th I, th I think we have an excellent program under the leadership of Chef, and we are proud to present some of that today. For my part, I would like to talk about surgery. Um, here, a septomyectomy is uh, how the surgery is often called for this particular disease. However, I would like to claim that it is more of a surgical repair of obstructive hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. We'll come back to this point later. Now, to start uh, the conversation, I would like to say that we feel very fortunate and uh, honored to be part of this uh, institution. Uh, we have uh, more than a cent uh, century of excellence in our cardiac surgery program. We are you know, an expert in heart failure, uh, as well as uh, valve, aortic, coronary surgeries, so all kinds of open heart surgery uh, we perform here, and again we uh, we know it is we believe it is very important to be a big center to be able to provide a care in the complex patients uh, in uh, in patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Now, when we when when do we consider surgery in our program? And most importantly, like I said in, briefly in one of the, answering one of the questions, it is a team approach. Many patients do come to see me as the first entry to our, to our program, but we never uh, proceed with a surgery directly. We always uh, discuss the patient among all of us and we all, everybody sees uh, who sees me sees also sees Dr. Weiner. Roughly speaking though, these are the factors to consider surgery um, for, uh, or, or uh, surgery for uh, repair, surgical repair of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Patient factors include patient, or patient opinion, low risk patients, and young patients. Anatomical factors include other heart disease needing open with heart surgery, thick septum or thin septum, having abnormal mitral cords or abnormal mitral valve itself, lack of septal perforator in the coronary anatomy, and so forth. We talked about Mother content. And the, in our program, we are very excited to have uh, to welcome uh, this drug. And many, many of our patients are benefiting from this. Having said that, you know, like we, uh, we brief, I briefly talked about, I think you know, myectomy remains to play a key role in treating patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. This graph describes what kind of residual disease is seen after each therapy. Myectomy is a phenomenon, as you see on the left, the residual gradient more than 30, only 2%. Improvement of the NYHA, no improvement was seen only in 5% after myectomy. Compared to other modalities of therapy, certainly myectomy will fix the heart for sure, and likely will make, feel, make the patient feel better than other therapies. Having all said that, again, it, it is not our, our first line therapy. First line therapy is a medical management, an excellent medical management by Dr. Weiner, now including mother content. I would like to show one paper that's recently published, and that's the analysis of 6,000 myectomies reported in the STS, the Society of Thoracic Surgery National uh, Cardiac Surgery Database. They are surprisingly only 2% of the, of the cardiac surgery programs perform 10 or more myectomies, only 2%. And additional 2% performs only five to uh, 10 myectomies a year. Vast majority of the, of the programs do perform less than five cases a year. And it matters. It is myectomy, again, I wanna say surgical repair of HCM, is uh, one of the procedures that's well, very well known to be related to the, the, the volume being related to the outcome. This graph describes the relationship between the volume and complications. For instance, mortality. The blue, the light blue is the case where the less than one, one case is performed. 
red, yellow, green. As you see, progressively mortality decreases. In high volume center, mortality with myectomy is not currently less than 1% and almost zero. Same thing with the VSD, ventricular septal perforation. VSD can be created because we, we shave the septum, which separates the right and left ventricles. Needle pacemaker. And what's also the, the, the inspiring and amazing is the needle mitral valve replacement. As you know, this disease, hypertrophy, obstructive hypertrophic hypertrophy cardiomyopathy, involves the anterior mitral valve of the, the anterior leaflet or the mitral valve that occasionally and frequently induces mitral regurgitation. In an exper inexperienced hands, the valve gets replaced. However, for experienced surgeons, mitral valve definitely can be spared. Knowing the limitation of the surgical you know, experience, uh, that, knowing that it is coming from the fact that this operation is a quite, a, quite a subjective experience-based operation. Our program has been trying to establish a way to do this operation more objectively. One of the ways to do this, uh, which is unique in our program, is uh, it is just not possible to look at the heart uh, through a surgical, um, a surgical visualization. However, we can feel the thickness of the muscle by using fingers. Another thing that we do routinely now is to ut utilize the cutting edge imaging. Using the CT angiogram and doing that uh, 3D reconstruction, now we calculate, before the surgery, we calculate, it, we calculate how much uh, muscle mass to remove at the time of the surgery. This, these two maneuvers has been helping our operation a lot. Now, septal band is something that we identified uh, through the uh, exercise of using 3D, 3D reconstruction of the, of the heart with the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. I'm gonna show you one of the hearts that we, now we 3D printed. Here, what you see is the aortic valve here and the mitral valve here. Since you don't see the heart every day, it, it is going to be difficult to appreciate what you are seeing. But essentially, I will, toward the end, I, I will show you the septum of the heart. And there you will see those thick muscle actually lining up in an oblique way within the, within the left ventricle. So again, aortic valve. This is the surgical valve, surgical view where we see the, the muscle through the aortic valve. This structure right here, this is the so we call septal band. Again, it is an oblique structure along with, on the septum. This is the thick area of the muscle. And we see this structure in every single heart with a patient with obstructive HCM. And again, we name this as septal band. This, the understanding this anatomy was extremely important for us in, in, in managing the, these patients surgically. We are not the only one who noticed this, uh, this structure. In other studies using MRI, similar concept was reported. Now, how relevant this, this concept is in surgery? We essentially changed our approach uh, on, of septal myectomy uh, from uh, removing the thickened part of the muscle uh, to removing this septal band. Again, it may sound like the same thing. Y yes, we are removing the thickened part of the septum. However, recognizing this oblique structure helps the surgeon to avoid critical structures such as conduction system or mitral valve structure yet allowing you know, the performing the operation in a more systemic uh, systematic way we perform the re the resection in three in three ways first we remove the the middle part second we remove more toward the the, the, the area close to the mitral valve and followed by the area deeper toward the apex I'm going to show a surgical video. So now if you don't want to uh, see a surgery in the video, no, please don't. I'm sorry about this, but I, I thought it is an interest of yours to show that. 
just to review the anatomy briefly, this is how the, how the surgical view looks like. We look at the heart or the septum through the aortic valve. The aortic valve is the structure about a size of a quarter. So surgical view is extremely limited. And that's why this operation is quite not um, the experience based. Essentially, through this small surgical view, we remove the muscle. So this is how we do the surgery. First, we palpate the septum in order to understand the thickness of the septum. And this is the surgical view. Again, we are looking at the septum through the aortic valve. We, we do the resection in three parts. First, we make a, a deep incision in the septum. And then along those two guiding incisions, um, connecting th those two guiding incisions, we remove the septal muscle. This remains somewhat subjective, but we do know based on the pre-op 3D CT, how much of the muscle to remove. This is the sec second uh, part of the, the resection more toward the mitral valve. And each time we try to remove as much po as, uh, as possible toward the apex to re avoid any residual septal uh, the ventricular gradient. And then this is the third part of the resection, more toward the septum. I'm sorry, more toward the apex. And then finally, we calculate the resection volume you know, in the syringe. In the syringe. What we noticed after, you know, by doing these uh, dedicated CT scan before and after surgery is uh, the fact of uh, LV remodeling. Somebody asked whether there's any added, added uh, benefit of uh, mavacantin. In, in the myectomy, certainly we see the reduction of the volume around the area where we did the myectomy. In this CT scan, the pre -myect before the myectomy, this is the area of the, the problem. And certainly that area is all thinned out. However, we also found that other area of the LV muscle is also getting thinned out. Therefore, overall LV remodels in a very favorable way, which we believe contributes to the, to the improvement of the symptoms and hopefully improvement in the longevity as well. Now, mitral valve. Mitral valve is another thing we pay a lot of attention in this disease. And this is why we shouldn't call this operation as just a septal myectomy. We repair the mitral valve during this operation. And the, this is one of the examples of showing the mit how the mitral valve could be abnormal. We examine the mitral valve carefully and we identify a variety of an anomalies, you know, um, which we will we won't go into the detail. But in this, in this, in this case, we are resecting the abnormal the abnormal course attached to the anterior mitral leaflet, or even this, this one is even the papillary muscle, muscle structure is directly inserting into the, the mitral valve. And oh, it is well known that some the, mit, the patient, in these patients, anterior mitral leaflets are very elongated. So the, with a surgery, we can also shorten that to try to make the anatomy as normal as possible. Again, coming back to my the, um, the title slide, the, we do more than just thinning the muscle. Therefore, you know, in the, one of the editorials, he said this operation should be called repair, surgical repair of obstructive HCM instead of septal myectomy. In summary, um, sorry, surgical HCM repair will continue to be an important therapy for patients with obstructive HCM, even with the cardiac myosin inhibitors. Surgical HCM, HCM repair needs to be done by experts. Understanding anatomy beyond septum is the key, and we continue to advance our effort to make the surgery more objective. Again, thank you, Lisa and everybody, and um, I would like, I'd um, love to answer any of the questions that you may have. Thank you, Hiro. That was fantastic. And I can remember the first time I saw your 3D image, I started telling everybody about it. And now, last I talked to Nick Smadira, he's like, hey, there's this 3D technology. I'm like, ah, no, uh, I saw it a while ago. So um, that's a, that was really innovative. And to be able to image the heart in such a way to really see the anatomy so you know what you're working with before you get in there, um, it's fabulous. We do have one question um, 
I'm sure now that we're pausing, there'll be more write, people writing. Um, people don't understand whether the heart is moving or not while you're operating on it. Can you talk us through how a person is prepped for a myectomy? Right. So certainly, though, first uh, to directly answer your question, the heart is uh, not moving. Um, so in regular heart surgery, and including you know, sur surgery for my you know, for HCM, the heart is arrested because so that we can do the surgery without looking at the blood or without the, the heart moving. And generally, it is extremely helpful for the surgery for the, you know, the coronary artery disease or valve disease. But that is a problem with this surgery. This sur that, that is because you know, this obstruction occurs in a dynamic way. And the obstruction can be visualized only when the heart is moving, especially that when the heart is vigorously moving, which we will lose during the surgery. And that is uh, uh, a big reason why this operation is so subjective and experience-based. It is an excellent question. Uh, many people, including us, are trying to establish a way to assess the septal anatomy during the surgery. But I think, though, like Lisa no, kindly said, we believe uh, looking at the anatomy of the heart carefully before the surgery with, it, with the 3D CT is a very inno innovative and helpful way to delineate the anatomy. You brought up um, information about the volume of surgeries done. Um, there's also a recent paper out of Cleveland Clinic. Um, I think it was Melinda. So I looked at um, like a Medicare database as to who was doing myectomies and what the outcomes were and the reoperation rates. There's a whole bunch of other downstream. Um, you do other heart surgeries other than myectomy. Why to you as a surgeon, is it so crucial to be a high volume operator to do this well? Yeah, that's a you know, critical question. No, I, the myectomy is a, uh, no, one of the operations, one of the one of the five or six operations that volume outcome association has been studied very well. And the other operations, by the way, no, uh, to no, name them, it's an aortic dissection, mitral valve repair, and those are the, uh, the operations. And those are the operations, the stake is very high and the technical component is uh, significant. And myectomy is, as I showed you in the video, uh, no concept is uh, straightforward. I always say that to the patients. No, you we just thin the thin the septum. It's almost like no concept of butcher. You just cut it off, but you have to do that through a tiny, tiny aortic valve opening, and that is very difficult. And also, during the surgery, the heart again, heart is not moving, and it's you know not moving the heart, not move like the not knowing the anatomy very well and not knowing very well how much to move, to take out, the, this operation is very, very difficult. I've had a rare opportunity of being conscious in an operating room once while watching this happen. And I was absolutely astonished at what a tiny little hole that you have to operate through and how delicate it is. It just took up our whole screen, so it looked very big but we're dealing with very small spaces and you really need to know what you're cutting, how deep you're cutting and to be able to visualize that whole ventricle. I know I sound like a broken record when I talk about high volume center of care models matter. I don't think it matters more than in myectomy. This is it. Uh, I've seen terrible things happen in low volume centers and Admittedly, even the best surgeons, occasionally you don't get it all the first time and you have to revisit. It's a complicated surgery. Um, I have somebody going for a second myectomy seven years later coming up. It happens even in the best of hands, but your chances of having it happen because of inappropriate resectioning, not taking enough, not cutting at the right angles, goes up exponentially when you're doing it with a low volume operator. It just does. And that's part of the reason, and I'm gonna go back to my talk, why we started to offer travel grants. If it's just because you can't buy a plane ticket and you can't get to the center, we wanna take that barrier away from you. 
we want to make it more available to everybody in the country to get to a high volume center. So please take us up on these opportunities for these travel grants. We do have another question. This is a great question. For those who are post myectomy, is there a non-invasive way to repair the mitral valve if the valve is still a problem or becomes a problem post-op? That is the that this is an excellent question. I'm going to answer my way, and then also I'm going to ask Chef to you know they address this as well. The you no, know, it really depends on the the anatomy, the reason mechanism of the problem of the mitral valve. If the mitral valve is a problem, say mitral regurgitation is persisting after the myectomy, frequently that comes with a residual gradient. So no, in, in in addition to or instead of just focusing on repairing the mitral valve, you may need a repair of the LVOT again. In which case, like Lisa said, sometimes you do need another myectomy or septal ablation. There are innovative ways which we entertain in these difficult cases. Uh, for instance, we can entertain mitral flip or other transcatheter therapies. But I don't. I think no. It really depends on the anatomy and the risk profile of the patients. Shep? Yeah, I agree completely, Hiro. Um, and as you mentioned, you know, we're lucky at Columbia to have such you know, robust resources throughout cardiology and cardiac surgery, including the valve center. So we've had some high-risk patients who are you know, not surgical candidates where you say, well, maybe an alcohol septal ablation and then a transcatheter mitral therapy like a mitral clip would be the way to go if there's nothing else available. So yes, uh, would be you know, the, the short answer and the longer answer would be exactly, as you say, based on anatomic and technical considerations, whether or not that is an option for the individual patient. But yes, something we definitely would explore if needed. You tapped in with a term that we didn't really explain to our viewers, a mitral clip. Can you talk a little bit about what a mitral clip is? Yeah, so, you know, Hero obviously elegantly described the way that the mitral valve is repaired uh, you know, during surgery, but, you know, for some reasons, you know, patients may not be a surgical candidate, and this happens outside of HCM and just patients with either primary or secondary mitral valve disease, uh, where you'll be thinking about a, a less invasive uh, percutaneous or transcatheter uh, mitral repair. Uh, and a clip uh, is just that. It's a, it's a device delivered by a catheter where you try to, uh, you know, reapproximate uh, the coaptation of the anterior and the posterior leaflet of the mitral valve, and you decrease the regurgitant orifice or the space where the, the backflow of the mitral valve uh, allows blood to leak. So uh, that's something that uh, is you know done routinely at NYP Columbia and other places as well. Um, and it's a good option for patients who have residual symptoms or heart failure from mitral regurgitation that cannot be definitively treated with surgery. That was a comprehensive answer. Thank you very much. So um, we don't use them very often in HCM uh, mitral clips, but there have been specifically with elderly individuals, a, a good opportunity to try to get that valve back a little bit. Um, you can't get the valve or the mitral clip out though. Is that correct? Once it's in, it's in? Yeah. And sometimes you need two clips. Um, you can put in more than one clip if, uh, if you still have residual regurgitation, but uh, yes, once it's in, it's in. It's a little daunting to have it once it's in, it's in. Okay, we are off to our next talk. I guess we're hearing from Jay next. Is that what's up? He's been all sitting right. there so quietly all night. Hi, Jay. Hello. All right. So I've been waiting for this opportunity to present our research. So uh, I'm Jay. I'm one of the um, cardiologists at the Columbia HCM Center and the research director here. So for today's talk, I am going to introduce one main project of ours, which is titled uh, Prediction of Cardiac Events by Proteomics in HCM. The term proteomics uh, is a pretty new word. Everyone essentially would be unfamiliar with this word. So I'm going to explain in detail uh, what this means in the later slides. But to start with, let me uh, start with my personal story. I was introduced to HCM's potential for a sudden cardiac death during my very first month 
of the physician at the interim fresh out of medical school. My first rotation was on the cardiology floor. And one evening, a patient who was known to have HCM came into the emergency room because of sustained ventricular tachycardia. Um, knowing that this is a lethal arrhythmia or potential, potentially lethal, lethal arrhythmia, we treated him with a number of medications such as beta blocker and sodalol, but he, he continued to have episodes of non-sustained ventricular tachycardia. We could not possibly suppress them. Um, and I was so enthusiastic and motivated at the time as a fresh uh, doctor that I stayed in the hospital on the cardiology floor unit uh, floor every night. And I began to notice that the patient's episodes of non-sustained ventricular tachycardia occurred most often during the night inspiring a revelation that the patient could have sleep apnea, which is known to introduce or induce arrhythmia. Usually sleep apnea affects people with a high BMI, essentially obese people, but his BMI was about 19, less than the average. So sleep apnea, the trigger of his arrhythmia was not at the top of our mind. However, a polysomnography uh, attests to diagnose sleep apnea showed that he had a central sleep apnea, a subtype of sleep apnea not related to obesity, but that does affect people with heart failure. So we treated the sleep apnea with CPAP and that eradicated his arrhythmias. It was at that time uh, that I decided to devote my career to the, to the care and research of patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And we published this case as a case report. So here are today's topics on one, the first one, why is it important to predict cardiac events in patients with HCM? The second topic is what is proteomics? And the third one is the application of proteomics to predict cardiac events in HCM. So let me start with the, start with the part one, why is it important to predict cardiac events in HCM? This is a case of a 22 year old basketball player who died after collapsing during the game. Autopsy revealed that he actually had HCM. As you know, sudden cardiac death could be the first manifestation of HCM. Here's another example of a young athlete who died on the field while playing soccer. Indeed, HCM is the most common cause of sudden cardiac death in young athletes um, in the United States. This pie graph shows causes of sudden cardiac death in young athletes. As you can see here, HCM constitutes 35% of causes of sudden cardiac death in young athletes. Then why is it important to predict sudden cardiac death in patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and other cardiac events. It is because interventions are available already to prevent these devastating events. For example, a device, an ICD or implantable cardioviral defibrillator can be implanted and effectively prevent sudden cardiac death. So let me move on to the next topic, which is what is proteomics? So I'm gonna use this slide to explain the concept of proteomics. First of all, what is omics? Just like genome, uh, what is uh, the ohm? Just like the genome means the entire set of genes, ohm means the entire set of something. Therefore, proteome means the entire set of proteins that is produced, that are produced in the body. Then what is proteomics? It is a large scale investigation or experimental analysis of proteins. Typically the term proteomics is used when concentrations of thousands of proteins are measured simultaneously. For example, with the current um, technology, we can measure about 7,000 protein concentrations at the same time. 
This technology, proteomics, has been used to predict cardiac events in patient populations other than HCN. For example, in this study of patients with coronary heart disease, they found that nine proteins predict cardiovascular events. And the addition of these nine proteins to the conventional score significantly improved the accuracy of prediction. This is a good example showing proteins can be used to discover proteins that predict future cardiac events. Then why not HCM, right? Despite the importance of predicting cardiac events in patients with HCM, all studies so far targeted non-HCM populations. Therefore, um, I have decided to apply this new technology to predict cardiac events in patients with HCM. That was in 2014. So it took me about eight years to, com to complete this study. All right, so let me move on to the last topic of today's talk, which is application of proteomics to prevent, uh, predict cardiac events in patients with HCM. So this is the main slide of this uh, today's presentation. It's a little bit busy, but I'm gonna walk you through each of the uh, components of this slide. So start to start with, we recruited 245 patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, followed at either Columbia or Harvard. And the reason we involved multiple in institutions was because a prediction model that is good that that is good at one one institution may not be good at another institution. So we developed the developed the prediction model at Harvard and validated the prediction accuracy at Columbia. After drawing blood from these 245 patients, we performed proteomic profiling. Um, the current technology that we use only requires 0.05 milliliter of blood, so 50 microliter of blood to perform prote proteomic profiling. And we measured um, about 5,000 proteins in the blood. The current, the most up updated technology can measure 7,000, but at that time, a few years ago, we were only measure 5,000, which was enough to achieve this, this goal. And then we, we followed up these patients for several years to document which patient experienced a cardiac, adverse cardiac event, such as sudden cardiac death, and which patient did not. And after a few years of follow-up, we developed a prediction model using the protein concentrations at the time of enrollment, so at the beginning of the study. And the model accurately predicted which patient, patients would experience major cardiac events and which patient would not, as shown on the right upper corner. So this graph is, shows event-free survival. So if some anyone has a cardiac event, then this graph goes down. And the x axis you see follow up days. So, if you're uh, a patient was determined as having low risk of having um, cardiac events based on proteomic prote profiling, then that's shown in the, uh, in the blue bar. So, they didn't, didn't really have any cardiac events during the follow up. By contrast, patients who are deemed to have, have high risk based on protein profiling did have a lot more cardiovascular events than the other group. In addition, as shown on the right lower side of this, of this slide, we were able to elucidate the molecular mechanisms under, underlying the development of cardiac events. And this study was featured on our website. Um, so please visit nyp.org slash advances-cardiology for more details. Thank you for your attention. The first time I went to a talk on proteomics, 
it was about 15 years ago. And the speaker was brilliant. And I didn't understand a damn thing she said. I'm like, I, 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 I see where you're going, but I don't see the connections. Um, that was 15 years ago. Things have changed. I kind of thought we'd see more protonomic discussion over the years, but we haven't. Why do you think there's, other than the fact that it's really complicated to get to the basics of protonomics, if genomics are hard enough, why do you think it's taken so long to really start seeing this? In uh, yeah, Lisa, this is a great question. And the answer is kind of clear on the, so in order to predict cardiac events in patients with ACM and other populations, you need hundreds of patients, hundreds, hundreds of blood specimens and years of follow-up. The key is that uh, we, all, we need blood specimens because it's easy to access. However, in order to perform proteomics profiling in blood specimens, the conventional technology that you probably heard 15 years ago is not enough because the protein concentration in the blood is much, much lower than that in the heart or heart muscle. So that's why we needed a new, relatively new technology that allows us to measure very, very low concentration uh, protein to high concentration protein. The abundance actually um, is um, spanning eight logs of abundance. So femtomolar to micromolar is a very wide range of concentration, very, very low to very, very high. So in order to measure these, this wide range of concentration accurately, we needed to wait for a new technology to emerge and which happened over the last, I would say, five years. Where do you think we might be able to implant this theories and the, the technology and the understanding of protonomics into patient care? Right, so it's not a prime time yet. And the reason is that we were able to um, predict major adverse cardiovascular events but we were we haven't yet um, developed a model to predict sudden cardiac death for which ICD implantation would be very helpful. So in the future, hopefully, if we have enough, we could enroll enough number of patients, probably exceeding thousand patients, and perform follow-up of a few years at least. Then we may be able to develop a prediction model based on uh, blood proteomics to predict sudden cardiac death for like lethal arrhythmia such as ventricular tachycardia. Uh, then we should be able, it should be able to, uh, it, it will be an actionable information for physicians to determine whether or not a patient needs ICD or not. So I want to just set expectations here because I see some excited questions popping up. When can I okay. get my blood work to see if I'm at risk? Um, so in terms of trials and numbers and time and power, we are talking about number one, you got to go get a nice big old grant to do a project like this. Number two, we have to get a thousand patients recruited. Number three, we have to follow them for a period of time and get all their clinicals and follow over time. So best case scenario, we're a three to five year window before something would be started to be extrapolated from that data. And then another year probably of, of data collection, mining, st statisticians, and all of those people getting involved. So it's a potential for our future. Um, but we're not there yet. But I love the idea of identifying new methods to identify risk profile, using your body to tell you what's happening, making it very individualized. So um, I went off on a little bit of a rant there just to clarify some of the things that you're going to be asked in just one second. So let me go to their questions. Um, Phyllis, I'll get to yours in just a moment because you're a call back to another talk. Um, oh, Christina, hi. Good to see you. Um, 
It's incredible. Is this test available to those of us who are at risk for cardiac arrest, but experiencing changing defibrillators? Uh, is there a way to participate in a study in the future? Do Definitely. we have a trial yeah. yet? We don't have a trial. Uh, the, we, we are still enrolling this um, not really randomized clinical trial, but prospective observational study. So there is no intervention um, involved but we're just drawing blood, analyzing proteins and uh, performing follow-up um, because just like I said, uh, we need a larger number of people participating and being followed up. And we'll be happy to um, involve you if you have ever a chance to come to Columbia uh, or nearby. So you would need the patients in-house to participate in this trial. They can't go from I don't know, maybe Washington State. Easy. That's going to be slightly difficult because we have to process the fresh blood immediately after drawing blood. We have to spin them, aliquot them, separate from blood cells to with plasma, and freeze them at negative 80 degrees Celsius. That would be hard to do while traveling yeah. across the country. That's exactly why. Yeah. So um, I'm sure if anybody is interested, um, they can email Jay or we can forward yep. an email to Jay and, and then you can get involved uh, with that you study. Um, the question from Paul, what is, it, what is the type of blood testing being used to determine whether an ICD is warranted? So I think we just kind of went through that, but. Um, yeah, we are hoping but, or dreaming to realize that, but we're not there yet. Yeah. Hopefully in the future. Uh, Andy's asking, it's interesting. And do you think it could be used outside of those with HCM? The answer so far uh, for me is probably negative, probably not. Um, uh, just because I'm only interested in patients with HCM, I only recruited those people <laughs> and tested this model only in these people. So I would be, uh, I would say at least you have to be very, very careful extrapolating this, this model or a prediction model. And I would probably imagine that this would not work in other populations than it because it seems very unique and special. I would venture to guess that if you were successful in this endeavor and we were to prove that you could find a marker that was actionable, that other disease states would then jump on and use your theories to see if it proved out in other disease states. Um, we'll let them do that. You stay in HCM, Jay. We like you here. So yeah. And then also, also the same approach may prove that different sets of proteins are uh, predicting uh, the future cardiac events in different states. So that may be exciting to find. So I, I will challenge you all with this one, and I don't know the answer to this. Um, so we know we've talked about HCM being, you know, a, a genetic disease, and we know some of the markers, but we only can find 40% of them. And then there's the theory that, you know, that there could be multiple mutations or polygenetic issues as to why we have HCM, multiple genes that we haven't identified yet and how they interact. Right. If we're looking at proteomics in much the same way, we're going to have to understand all of the various pathways and we haven't done it in the genetics yet. And now we're going basically below genetics into proteomics. Um, do you see the genes interplaying with the proteomic data? Are they going to be used in silos together? How is all this yeah. going to be put together? Yeah, that's another great question. We still do not know whether or not the protein profile is different between genotype positive patients and genotype negative patients. So that's gonna be our next project. I like um, that project. Yeah, if they are the same, then that would suggest a merging pathway, like a common mutual pathway between genotype positive and genotype negative patients. If they're different, then that's another interesting story because they have different mechanisms underlying their ACM development. So that would be an interesting uh, project. Interesting. Okay. We do have one other question. I'm going to open it up for all questions now. 
if anything throughout the night or something else comes to mind, please put it in the uh, Q&A box right now. And then we'll go through a couple more questions and then we'll say goodbye to Facebook. Um, so hello back to you, Christina. That was cute. Uh, oh, here we go. So Phyllis asked a question earlier. Please clarify the effects you mentioned of Mavicampton on mitral regurgitation. Has there been any data? What do we know? Yeah, so what I was mentioning is that, you know, in patients where there's an improvement in LV alpha tract obstruction uh, and, you know, mitral septal contact, you know, there's the, you know, expectation that perhaps you would see some improvement in mitral regurgitation. Just based on looking at our own echoes in patients receiving Mavicampton, we, we've seen that. Um, you know, there have been some echo data uh, published um, and or you know, at least looked at and presented with, uh, with Mavicampton, focusing mostly on LV mass index and left atrial volume. Um, I'm sure, you know, again, continuing to be looked at the degree of mitral regurgitation, but just like if you improve uh, obstruction with, with surgery, you know, mitral valve gets better. Sometimes it needs independent repair. Sometimes it doesn't, um, as Hero mentioned. Um, so that's what I was kind of, uh, getting at with the, uh, with Mavic Hampton as well. Okay. <laughs> this next question, I am going to repackage. Um, would we please discuss risk factors for sudden death in HCM as we know them today in 2023, and then I will ask a qualifying question. Sure. Um, so fortunately, I mean, tremendous progress has been made in our ability to identify clinical risk factors for sudden death and the appropriate use of implantable cardio defibrillators. You know, traditionally, the sudden death risk per year for HCM populations was estimated to be, you know, 6% per year. Uh, and now in, in modern cohorts, it's less than 0.5% per year, which is essentially what it is in the general population. So what makes the difference? It's identifying people who are at risk and having a treatment that's available to lower that risk. Um, so there's a couple of ways to do it. Uh, our practice is to follow uh, the AHA ACC guidelines, which you know have a nice approach to uh, the use of a secondary prevention ICD. God forbid someone has a start, sudden cardiac arrest and survives. Um, uh, and then also primary prevention. So the established risk factors uh, that we look at are a family history of, of sudden cardiac arrest in uh, a first degree relative or multiple non first degree relatives, a uh, personal history of syncope, which sometimes can be a little bit difficult um, because there are sometimes other factors that could cause syncope in, in HCM, whether it's due to obstruction or whether it's a patient with HCM who has uh, a history of vasovagal neurocardiogenic syncope. So we look for more malignant or rhythmic features of the syncope history and also recent syncope. It's been shown that syncope that's, you know, several years in the past is, is much less of a risk than, and then more recent syncope. Uh, looking at massive hypertrophy, massive septal hypertrophy of, of greater than 30 millimeters, or even kind of borderline massive in, in 26, 28 millimeter range, especially in, in young patients. And that's something to mention as well, which doesn't really make its way into the guidelines, but aging in general is, is protective uh, in HCM. And you know, once you're at age 60, although you're still young, you know, the risk of having uh, a significant ventricular uh, arrhythmia is much lower. And uh, the data support and our experience supports the idea of putting a defibrillator in someone above the age of 60 is much less common uh, than doing it in someone under the age of 60. So age, I think, is an important arbiter of risk that sometimes gets overlooked, uh, but that's how, how we approach it. Uh, additionally, uh, you're going to look for um, features of arrhythmia that may be a harbinger of sustained ventricular tachycardia, ventricular fibrillation, specifically ambulatory heart monitoring, looking for NSVT or non-sustained ventricular tachycardia. Uh, NSVT is not all created equal. We're looking for NSVT that is frequent, meaning greater than one or two episodes per 24 to 48 hours. We're looking for NSVT that is fast, meaning greater than 200 beats per minute on average, uh, and NSVT that is long, meaning greater than 10 beats. So you may say, oh, I had, my doctor did a Holter monitor and I had you know, one four beat run of NSVT over a week at an average heart rate of 134. That's not really something that's that's going to increase your risk in terms of uh, needing a defibrillator. So that's something we look at as well. Uh, the other issues are if you have a drop in systolic function, specifically less than 50 percent, 5-0, uh, that's going to increase your risk. Or if you have an LV apical aneurysm. So we we talk about apical HCM and the apical variant is you know the hypertrophy of the apex, but 
Uh, there's patients, particularly patients who have mid-cavity hypertrophy, who then therefore get an LV8 local aneurysm. That's an associated risk factor for, for sudden death. So those are factors that we look for, and if they're present, uh, it would be reasonable um, to consider a primary prevention ICD. If none of those are present, then we'll also now look at cardiac MRI, which is incorporated uh, into the 2020 guidelines. And if the cardiac MRI, which should be done with gadolinium contrast, um, and if the, what we call percent LGE or the percent of the myocardium that has late gadolinium enhancement, which is a marker of fibrosis and scar is greater than 15%, 1-5-15%, that also is a risk factor. Um, so that's the way we approach it. Uh, the Europeans have the ESC risk score, which is a little bit different, uh, which we generally don't use, uh, but sometimes can be helpful uh, in terms of estimating you know, risk of sudden death over a several year period. Uh, but with these technologies and these tools that are available, we've been able to lower the risk of sudden death. And you know, what Jay is discussing is really kind of the next frontier to further kind of individualize that approach, which is exciting to hear about. So thank you for that very descriptive explanation. And I did forget for a second, we do have one more talk coming tonight, so we'll get to that in just a second. But sure. if somebody has had a cardiac arrest in an ambulance and they are resuscitated, the device of choice should be a defibrillator, not a pacemaker. Would that be a correct statement in the situation where somebody's already survived a cardiac arrest? Correct. So, so sudden cardiac arrest, um, if you survived sudden cardiac arrest, then you would have what we call secondary prevention defibrillator. Um, and defibrillators are designed to, to shock you know, dangerously fast arrhythmias. Most defibrillators have the ability to have a backup pacing setting if needed. So there is kind of built-in pacemaker function into a defibrillator, but correct, you know, the, the primary device is defibrillation. To the individual that asked that question, please call the office and let's have a conversation and get you aligned with uh, care providers that might be a little bit more uh, savvy on HCM management. Shep, I'm gonna hand it back to you for your next talk. Terrific, so, um, and again, I wanna thank uh, Jay and Hero for joining us tonight. Um, you know, really terrific talks and the ability to work with them every day is uh, a big part of uh, making my day enjoyable. So thanks guys for, uh, for contributing and uh, thank everyone also for their attention as we head into the, the next phase of the, uh, of the presentation. So I will try not to get disconnected. That's good. Um, let's try. Uh, can't, can't promise, but uh, let's see how things go. Um, I can so see the reflection of your screen in your window. I can kind of help navigate you. Okay, there we go. Um, so let's see. So hopefully now we're into slideshow mode. Great. But you're not on screen share. Oh, hold on. All right, one second. So let's see. Sorry about that. Let's see what happened there. Let's share that again. And then you're going to see my reflection. You may see Lisa. That's me. <laughs> yes. Hopefully now you'll see me or at least see my slides. I see your slides. Yeah. Good to go. Okay, Good to great. go. So, all right, so this is something that uh, is a very important part of the, the HCM consultation and evaluation. As we've mentioned, we spend a lot of time talking about the relief of symptoms, uh, risk stratification for sudden death, role of cardiogenetic testing, uh, but exercise is always something we try to uh, leave a lot of time to review uh, when a patient comes in to talk about HCM because the question comes up and says, doc, you know, what can I do? So exercise in HCM. Uh, we want to review data and considerations related to exercise in patients with HCM. And as Jay showed you, you know, kind of the, the classic literature from Dr. Barry Marin, that cardiovascular disease is the leading cause of sudden death in, in U.S. athlete registries. And it was estimated that HCM or possible HCM may have been responsible for about 50% of sudden death. Um, and that was kind of the mantra that we've all uh, grown up with in terms of how we approach uh, HCM and, and risk for sudden death. Uh, traditional um, scientific statements uh, have reflected that concern for, for exercise in HCM. Uh, this is taken from circulation in 2015, where uh, you'll see under number two, athletes with a probable or unequivocal clinical expression and diagnosis of HCM, so the disease phenotype of the LV hypertrophy, should not participate in most competitive sports with the exception of those that are low intensity. This recommendation is independent of age, sex, magnitude of LV hypertrophy, particular sarcomere mutation, presence or absence of LV alpha tract obstruction, at rest or with physiologic exercise, absence of prior cardiac symptoms, presence or absence of LGE or fibrosis on CMR, and whether major interventions such as surgical myectomy or alcohol ablation have been performed previously. Class three level of evidence C, expert consensus, but generally 
uh, patients with HCM were precluded uh, from doing more intense exercise. When we talk about exercise, we talk about a static component, uh, which is really the blood pressure load. Uh, and then we also talk about um, uh, the dynamic component, uh, which is the cardiac output. So unless you were a, a bowler, cricket, curling, golf, rifle, or yoga, if you moved into more exertional sports, uh, you traditionally would be excluded uh, if you were an HCM patient. And this was based on the concern that vigorous physical exertion creates an unstable substrate that increases susceptibility to sudden cardiac death. Um, and the risk of sudden death in athletes, I showed you what historically it was, but this is something that people have continued to look at more recently in more modern cohorts to say, is that really what the risk is? And most of us aren't professional athletes. Uh, you know, you're a patient uh, who has HCM and you want to know what kind of exercise you can do to maintain your cardiovascular fitness. And these are the questions that we try to answer for you when you come see us. Um, so the overall incidence of sudden cardiac death in young athletic cohorts is actually very low. It's estimated to be about one to three in 100,000 person years. And that's actually similar to the frequency of sudden cardiac death in the young general population. Uh, as Lisa mentioned, uh, yeah, March 4th, 1990 is a day that, uh, that I know because when you talk about exercise in HCM, uh, Hank Gathers um, does enter the conversation as, as it should. Uh, Hank Gathers was a premier NCAA Division I college basketball player uh, up there with the likes of Shaquille O'Neal at that time, uh, who was known to have HCM uh, and unfortunately had a cardiac arrest on the court and was not resuscitated. Uh, and when this type of event happens to an athlete, it's very visible in our society. Uh, it's very troubling to see a young person who seems to be at the pinnacle of health uh, have this, this type of event. Um, and when it does, it makes sudden death in an athlete seem like a much more common phenomenon than it really is. It's very rare, but it's very tragic and it's very troubling. Uh, and it does push us uh, you know, to try to understand this better. And, and like Lisa said, you know, the situation with Damar Hamlin uh, on Monday Night Football two and a half weeks ago really is a teachable moment for everyone showing you the importance of early high quality CPR and early defibrillation and the difference uh, in outcomes that can happen now uh, compared to 32 years ago. Uh, fortunately, more recent data have suggested a lower incidence of HCM as a cause of sudden death in athletes. The US uh, NCAA uh, association survey found to be maybe more like 8% of sudden death was due to HCM, kind of challenging some of the, the earlier numbers. Uh, and there's been some work uh, to try to better look at this. This was from the American Journal of Medicine in 2016, uh, which was a meta-analysis uh, where Medline was searched for published studies between 1990 and 2014, retrospective cohort studies, patient registries, autopsy series examining sudden cardiac death in young individuals defined as less than the age of 35 were included. Uh, and it was a combined sample of 4,600 subjects. And again, the methodology all isn't perfect, but it's a large group of subjects. Um, and it was found that HCM is not a more common finding at death than structurally normal hearts in young subjects with sudden death. Um, so, you know, the take home message here was that in young non-athletes and military members, structurally normal hearts were more common actually than hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And in athletic subjects, there was no difference between HCM and structurally normal hearts. Again, questioning how likely really is HCM the driver for this. Uh, this was followed by a prospective study of sudden death among children and young adults, which was published in the New England Journal in 2016. And here you'll see causes of sudden cardiac death. And you know, you'd expect to see hypertrophic cardiomyopathy uh, leading the list, but it's really not. Unexplained causes, coronary artery disease, such as coronary artery anomalies, much more common in terms of number of cases of uh, causes of sudden cardiac death in this population and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy was actually less common. Uh, activity at the time of sudden death, uh, exercise and post-exercise, not the most common situation at the time of sudden death, actually more common uh, with sleep and rest. So patients with HCM are active um, and some are actually doing fairly vigorous activity. Uh, and a few years ago, there was the Live HCM uh, study, which was started, which is not an endorsement of competitive sports for HCM patients, but rather just a, a way to try to gather information and say, this is what our HCM patients are doing, and can we follow those outcomes and, and see really what's happening? Um, so this is ongoing, but you know, many patients with HCM, like I said, are doing exercise, and this is a prospective follow-up of cohort of a cohort of patients uh, looking for arrhythmic outcomes and vigorous exercises versus moderate to low-level exercises. Again, not endorsing doing more vigorous exercise without having uh, an assessment by your physician, but the concept that patients are doing this, you know, what's happening to these patients. 
Um, and is exercise actually beneficial uh, in patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy? Here published in JAMA in 2017, uh, looking at you know, patients with HCM and those that actually did a little bit more exercise actually had improvement in peak oxygen consumption uh, as measured on a CPET, and there was no difference uh, in adverse events during that study protocol. Uh, kind of the corollary or, you know, of that is the association of obesity with adverse long-term outcomes in HCM, that if you're an HCM patient and your BMS, BMI is high, is that going to actually affect your outcome? Uh, here seeing stratified BI, BMI, uh, that patients with higher BMIs, um, the percent of patients that were obstructed uh, were higher, uh, and that overall outcomes uh, and heart failure composite outcomes uh, were worse in patients with higher BMIs greater than 30 compared to patients with an uh, overweight BMI of 25 to 30 and a normal BMI of less than 25. So with all this background, there's been a call into question, which I think is appropriate about exercise in HCM. Is it a time for a change of heart? You know, can patients with HCM do more exercise? Can they do it safely? We have the ability to risk stratify patients uh, for the appropriate use of defibrillators, um, and we know that exercise is beneficial. Um, and you know, the 2020 guidelines, again, do highlight this, that clearly we don't want you to be inactive. And the general party line is that patients with HCM can do mild to moderate aerobic activity. What does that mean? That means kind of walking and talking type activity. Um, but it does appear that, you know, for certain individuals who are risk stratified of cardiac MRI, exercise echo, ambulatory monitors, don't have any massive hypertrophy, don't have any history of syncope, don't have any family history of sudden death, all the things that we previously just mentioned, which are, are risk factors for uh, ventricular arrhythmia, could you actually do more vigorous exercise or even participate in highly intense uh, competitive athletics? And again, this is not something you should go out and do on your own but you can at least have a conversation with your physician and say, well, what should I really be doing to maintain my cardiovascular fitness? I'm a patient with HCM, what's safe for me? Uh, and the guidelines do highlight that for patients with HCM, participation in high intensity recreational activity or moderate to high intensity competitive sport activities may be considered after a comprehensive evaluation and shared discussion repeated annually with an expert provider who conveys that the risk of sudden death and ICD shocks may be increased and with an understanding that the eligibility decisions for competitive sports participation often involve third parties, team physicians, consultants, and other institutional leadership acting on behalf of the schools or teams. But the fact that this language is even incorporated into the guidelines is such a sea change, and I think a, a, a positive one, emphasizing that most patients with HCM who are not competitive athletes can do a fair amount of recreational activity that's safe. And even for our patients who are elite athletes, can they actually participate in those sports? Um, we're not involved in the care of uh, Jared Butler at NYP Columbia, but we do do some work with the MBA. Um, Jared Butler, this is all public information, been very vocal. Um, he was on Baylor uh, uh, College University team in 2021 when they won the national championship, uh, was drafted by the Utah Jazz, now playing in their developmental or G League, but is playing in the NBA with HCM. And, and the idea that that, you can even say that, you know, five years ago, 10 years ago, you wouldn't think that would be possible. But the point is with appropriate risk stratification, shared decision-making, we can safely push the envelope in some patients who have HCM and wanna do more vigorous exercise. So in summary, for most HCM patients, mild to moderate recreational non-competitive exercise is definitely beneficial. For HCM patients participating in athletics, comprehensive and shared decision-making regarding risk of participating in sports is recommended and referral to an HCM Center of Excellence is helpful to address these complex management decisions. Um, so I really do think that um, there's been a change uh, in how we approach um, the conversation about exercise in our patients with HCM. I think it's a positive change that people are doing more. Obviously, you want to be safe, you want to be risk stratified, um, but you know, really a uh, definite uh, change in trend, which I think if done appropriately, uh, benefits the HCM community and the, and the individual patients that are doing more exercise. So we're ending on probably the most controversial area of HCM discussions. Um, we still are trying to learn a lot. Um, we know we know sitting down on a couch is definitely not the answer. We don't want people with HCM to just become sedentary so that you become a victim of obesity, diabetes, uh, coronary artery disease, joint problems, 
mental health issues related to being just too sedentary and isolated. That is not what we're looking for. You'll often hear us, if you call the HCMA and say, well, what can I do? We'll always say, first go see a specialist and check out your anatomy, understand your risks and have a conversation. And there are different physicians with different philosophies right now. And some would interpret some of the data that was presented tonight a little bit differently. Um, and we're in this really weird time where change is happening. We don't want people to be sedentary. We definitely want people to participate in exercise and moderate exercise, no questions asked. But that level of intense activity or intense competitive athletics, these are very difficult conversations. And there's kind of going back to the myectomy versus alcohol ablation issue. You really need to know what your anatomy is what your individual risks are before you can make those conversations meaningful. Um, what you want isn't always what you get, but somewhere in there, there's where's the line? We did a podcast maybe a year ago with a guy named Seth. He's from Long Island. Um, he was a hockey player, played pretty intensely, got his diagnosis of HCM, needed an ICD. So instead of intense competitive athletics, he went to recreational and then he went to refereeing. But then one day he got all excited because it was a really big game and he was the ref and he got all amped up and he had his ICD go off while he was on the ice. He's fine. He tells the story and tales from the heart. You can go listen to it. But what's critical is making the decision to compete doesn't mean you're completely safe. You have to accept some of those risks. And it's not always a black and white issue the sport, the weather, your hydration, your obstruction, all of these factors need to be really discussed carefully with experts who understand. And I'm gonna be really honest and say that there are some of our experts, good friends of mine that are much more permissive than others. Be careful if you're doctor shopping. If you think somebody has a reputation to give you the answer that you think you wanna hear, Go well, listen to the people who are going to tell you the things that maybe you don't want to hear because you need to weigh them all together. So um, I've just went on my little soapbox there. Shep, what do you think? Yeah, I agree completely. And by no means will we be able to resolve you know, the controversy and there definitely is a controversy, but I just want people to at least start the conversation you know, and say, you know, again, where most of us aren't elite athletes, we're talking about getting off the sofa and going for a walk or, you know, doing some sort of mild to mild, going for a hike with a loved one, you're doing activity that you know, most people would agree is beneficial. Um, and then there are the more select circumstances uh, where you know, may consider more intensive or even competitive athletics. But the fact that we're even having the conversation, I think reflects tremendous progress. And you're absolutely right. There are some people that will be excluded and there are certain you know, experts that you know, feel more strongly one way or the other. Um, and what is right or what is wrong, I, I, again, I, is not black and white, but the conversation should be had. And it's an important part of every HCM patient's, uh, you know, lifestyle well-being is to think about these things and say, am I doing enough exercise to stay healthy? Um, you know, what, what, are, what are my limits? What should I be doing? Um, and yes, for now, mild to moderate aerobic recreational activity generally is safe for most. Again, these are things you have to speak about with your doctor. And then under more select circumstances, uh, with an understanding of risk benefits, uh, with shared decision making, with repeated assessments, you know, are there some people that may be appropriate for more intense activity? You know, that that's the question, and 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 it's I, I think a, a good thing to to be kind of pushing and discussing, um, and most patients will benefit from that. But obviously, safety comes first. Absolutely, it, it's an area that still needs a lot of betting out. And I don't necessarily know that you're ever going to ha have a 100% solid answer, yes or no. It's all shades of gray. Um, I, I do want to lean into something else we've mentioned a couple of times tonight. And I think I may do a whole session just on this coming up. The concept of shared decision making. It sounds fabulous. Let's share in this decision making. But in reality, 
don't necessarily think that patients have the same definition of shared decision making as a physician does. Can you tell us, Shep, what does shared decision making mean to you, a clinician? Yeah, great question. Because I always, I want, I'm always curious to see what it means for a patient. Because sometimes I'll present something to a patient, and they'll say, "Well, why are you asking me? You, you know what I should do." And I say, "Well, I want to at least have a conversation with it." So for me, it's something that's conversational. It's understanding risk benefits and saying, "You know, this is what, you know, I think you can do. Can you partner in that decision with me?" Uh, I think it's a, really about a partnership. Uh, which depends on a mutual understanding. And yes, you know, the physician's responsibility is to inform the patient of the, the factors that are going to impact their decision to be able to, you know, participate in that type of discussion. So, you know, shared decision making is definitely a buzzword, but if it's not approached in that, you know, kind of comprehensive fashion, what does it really mean? For me, it's a partnership uh, in understanding risks and benefits with the patient so I can convey my opinion uh, and see what their preferences or beliefs are. And again, you're not just giving people the answer they want, uh, but you're just wanting them to participate in a back and forth. So that's what it is for me. Uh, I'll be curious to hear what it is for you, you know, from, from a patient. Well, it varies greatly. <laughs> Some people say, well, I wanted to share in that decision and I didn't want to have surgery, but that was the only thing that they were offering me. Well, then that means what that's what the option is. And then, um, there are some concerns from patients that particular physicians have particular biases. Biases are not bad things. They're just experiential and they like this versus that. So I try to encourage people to ask probing questions. Why do you prefer this over that? Have you written any papers on it recently? Do you have a strong pos position? Alcohol ablation versus myectomy, sports or no sports? Like, are you involved in this national debate at all and trying to figure out where your clinician's actually coming from. From the patient side, I actually think we can do some work here. Patients need to be educated consumers of healthcare product. And I've been saying that line for probably 35 years. So that's just giving you an idea of who I am. But if you don't understand what you're asking about and you don't understand all the variables, then go get help to figure it out. You didn't wake up one morning and decide to have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and understand everything about echo MRI, diagnostic testing, risk stratification, and all of the things that come with it. You were waking up one day and you found out you were in a land you didn't know very well. So let us help teach you, use the tools that we've created over 28 years, get in there, get educated, come to meetings like this and understand what to ask and how to participate in that shared decision-making and explain, this is what I'm trying to achieve. Can you help me get there and find that path to get there? Um, I think there's a lot we can learn from just listening to what expectations are and making sure that they are real expectations that have a possibility of coming true. And if not, sometimes we get answers we don't want. And the answers are, I'm sorry, this is where we are right now. There's no going back 10 years to bring you back to that person. Here's where we are. And here's the things that we can do today going forward. We all want to look back and change the past. We can't. We yeah. can't. So get educated, have good conversations, ask tough, tough questions. And if your clinician says, I don't know, I'm going to have to get back to you on that. That's one of the most honest answers you could possibly get when they don't have an answer to go get an answer. So don't think poorly of somebody who says, I wanna do a little bit more research before I address that. That came up about two weeks ago. They were surprised that their doctor had to look something up. Last I checked, you guys were human, right? Not robots? Correct. So we wanna make sure of that. Okay, we have a couple of questions and then we're gonna wrap up for tonight. Um, this is a very interesting one. Um, we have a 75 year old. That's not exercised over the past two years, post myectomy, and then went ahead for an ablation, for AFib, waiting on a pacer. How do you get somebody moving who's got cardiac challenges? I guess I'm going to reframe that question as she's doing some yoga twice a week, but she wants to do more cardiovascular work. Should she be doing that while we're waiting to manage this atrial fibrillation with a pacemaker? How do you counsel patients like this? 
Yeah, so a lot, lot of potential issues there. So hard to you know really provide you know specifics yeah. in that situation, uh, but I do think you know being sure of what you know the physician uh, recommends in terms of you know safely you know do you need the pacemaker before you exercise? Do we have to do the atrial fibrillation? You know sorting that out. But the concept is that you have a patient who's relatively sedentary and you want them to be more active and you know coming up with a, you know a prescription uh, for exercise. Um, you know, we utilize cardiac rehab, physical therapy all the time after heart surgery. Uh, and it's a shame that it's not really, you know, reimbursed by certain you know, insurance companies for just more general wellness and fitness. Um, but the, the principles of cardiac rehab remain the same, whether you're in a for formal program or not. Uh, we will rely, like I said earlier, a lot on exercise testing. I'll, I perform my own stress echoes on our patients so I can actually watch them exercise see what happens to their heart rate. Are they stopping because they're short of breath? Are they stopping just because they're generally fatigued? Um, you know, do they have chronotropic incompetence because they're on so much beta blocker to, you know, their heart rate doesn't go up. There's so much information you can get by watching someone exercise. So I rely heavily on that. So then I can give, you know, patients guidance and whether they wanna, you know, work with a specific trainer or a program, you know, first we'll start off by saying kind of, this is what your maximum heart rate should be. Uh, this is how much exercise you do. I mean, in general, the American Heart Association would recommend 150 minutes of moderate intensity exercise for all comers. You know, obviously for HCM, you have to be more specific, but like we just said, a walking and talking pace, mild to moderate aerobic activity should generally be safe as long as the acute medical conditions um, have been appropriately addressed. We watch people exercise and then therefore can then give them better guidance on what they can do on their own. I think that's a great answer. And I think if if insurance isn't paying for cardiac rehab, which typically if you do a myectomy, but don't touch the mitral valve, they won't pay. But if you touch the mitral valve, they'll pay. Exactly. Hero, yeah. just always touch the mitral valve. I'm only kidding. Yeah. Um, no insurance fraud here. But it is kind of a silly line in the sand. And we probably should go back and advocate for a change in the DRG and, and the you know reimbursement codes on that one. Um, yeah. So even if you're not getting it paid for by insurance, going to a couple of sessions of cardiac rehab and paying cash, I know nobody, you know, it's not always easy, but it's an investment in yourself and understanding where your limits are with exercise. So even if it's a little out of pocket, it might prove incredibly beneficial and reassuring so that you know where those lines in the sand are. Um, so Sally's one that had all the questions. I'm going to say goodbye to Facebook for now so we can ask any further questions. So goodbye, Facebook. It was nice knowing you. Um, 